um, can't explain how exciting it is to be introduced by Nigel Brown. For me, it's like being introduced by David Attenborough. It's, uh, Nigel has been instrumental in, in my career, um, although he probably doesn't know it. So yeah, thank you very much for that introduction, Nigel. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> and, and thank you for Steve for inviting me to talk. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to come back to Bang Bangaberg Group, which as Nigel's just given you a praise, is sort of where my career as a birder and, and an ornithologist began. Um, I, I'll um, give a brief introduction to myself now, which, which covers some of those bits that Nigel has. Um, sorry, if I keep looking up here, it's because all of your faces are up there and the talk's down on a screen below. So apologies if, it, if that's off-putting at all. Um, the talk I'll give tonight is a, a longer version of what I did for the BTO conference recently. So apologies if any of you um, joined that talk for the BTO conference, you'll know some of what I say here, but hopefully there's some extra tidbits that you'll you'll get from this. And, and the title of the BTO talk was there and back again, a shell duck tail, but I, I thought I would add some Bangor University graduate bits into it for those of you who are, um, have already heard some of this talk. So I'll start with a bit about me. Um, as Nigel said, I wasn't a birder until my gap year, really. I, um, I was, I've always been interested in, in animals and animal behavior and nature. Um, I'm def very definitely of the David Attenborough generation. Um, but uh, when I came to Bangor in 2011, I really just didn't know much, if anything, about birds at all. Um, I sort of fell into ringing with Steve Dodd and the Scan Ringing Group, um, which is where my, my birding love really kicked off. Um, as any of you who are ringers will know, it's very difficult to ring a bird if you can't identify it. So I had to learn <laughs> species identification pretty quickly. Um, and I, I, when I started ringing, I didn't realize how incompetent I was. So I had to learn a lot very quickly and Bangor Bird Group and Nigel and all of the other university students were instrumental in that. Um, and it was, it was lovely hearing Martin's um, weekly round up there it reminded me of Bangor Bird Group back in the day back in the lecture theatre with, with the weekly birding shipping forecast um, which gave us somewhere to aim for for our birding adventures every week um, so it was great so yeah here, here you can see a few pictures of my time um, this ridiculousness is a webs count at Lynn on uh, on Anglesey um, ringing Goosander at uh, Lamberis Lake um, and then and then my graduation in 2014, um, by which point I was a reasonably competent birder. I, I don't like to blow my own trumpet, but I certainly could tell a house sparrow from a chaffinch, which I couldn't when I started Bangor Uni. So it was uh, just a phenomenal time at Bangor. And I will always be grateful to the Bangor Bird Group for everything they taught me. Um, so it really is great coming back here. And, and, and now 99% of photos of me contain a bird or me goofing around whilst birding. So it, it really, my time at Bangor really has um, sculpted who I've become. And, and that time, uh, um, here's a bit of a roundup of where birding and that, that um, career tra trajectory has taken me. As Nigel mentioned, I started here in, in Vermwy, um, then came to Bangor Uni and worked all the way around Lavin, Lavin Sands with the Scan Ringing Group. Um, and Steve and Rachel, who lots of you will know, and Kelvin Jones um, sort of roped me into BTO work, which then took me to Clean Allow for webs counts. And I did some volunteering with the RSPB at South Stack and Maltrice. Um, then I, I did a couple of uh, stints on Bardsey, which again was, was brilliant, brilliant experience for, um, for developing my career. Um, because I was man, I managed to get a job on as a seabird field worker on Skomer Island just before I graduated in, in 2014, and my ringing permit and the experience from Bardsey was completely instrumental in that, um, as well as all the other experience I'd got at, at Bangor. Um, so, yeah, I I, really, I can't overstate how great Bangor is. Um, I hope all the students who are listening know what exciting future they've got if they make the full use of Bangor time. Um, and I've lived in Wales, so my husband, now husband, comes from down here and we now live up here. So Wales for me is the heartland. Um, but uh, so Skoma I did for three summer seasons in the winter. I went down south, um, as every good migrant does, goes to the southern hemisphere um, for the winter. Got lots of experience in Australia and New Zealand, um, which then led on to me doing uh, getting a um, job with BTO as ringing licensing assistant so again it was the the ringing skill that landed me my first 
proper job or the other, everything else was sort of short term contracts hopping from one contract to the next but this was a, my first full-time permanent position with the BTO who were again volunteering for them was was um, brilliant for getting experience and and through them I've then worked all over England and Wales um, the uh, the sort of continuous thread through all of this has been birding and ringing um, and, and you'll note that most of these jobs fairly coastal and that's because my my real love is seabirds and waders um, that's where most of my experience has been gained um, through and and as I mentioned the BTO gaining experience through their surveys um, so I'll, I'll tell you a little about a little bit about the BTO I hope most of you are aware of the BTO but an awful lot of people don't know much if anything about the BTO but they will have uh, volunteered for some of our surveys without really realizing who it is that organizes them so these five here are uh, the, the top ones that lots of people across the country get involved in um, garden bird watch bird track um, the ringing unit the ringing scheme breeding bird survey and webs are the, are the main five that people get involved with but we also run all of these if you're interested in any of them just go to our website and this go to project thing at the top um, gives you all the surveys that we manage you can see there's quite a few so our primary aim is to monitor birds across the whole you the whole of the uk and we work closely with um, bird life partners in ireland and the continent as well to build up a, a picture really of of what our bird populations are doing and how they're faring um, and, and monitoring them over time so lots of these surveys have been running for up to a century now um, so we have a pretty good handle at, uh, probably one of the, the few countries in the world that has such a, a good handle on what their populations of, of most of their bird species are doing um, so that, that's sort of what the BTO does and that's why I really love working for them uh, is because although we sort of an unsung heroes the data we provide to the government and stakeholders in so many industries really underpins uh, conservation and management of, of bird species in this country um, so I'd imagine a lot of you have, in, have done these surveys which are man managed by our surveys engagement and communications department so you might know about that side of BTO but we also have a pretty decent research side um, so I work for the wetland and marine research team, which I would be surprised if many of you have heard about. We're, we're sort of uh, the classic scientists who don't um, show their faces very often, but we're actually the largest department in the BTO. These are all of my colleagues. Um, it's also the, the four regional offices. So there's the England office, which is the head office, Scotland, Wales, which some of you will know, the, the three members of the Wales office, and Northern Ireland. Um, the Scotland office has more members than our department, but our department's the, um, the largest single department. And as our name suggests, we focus on wetland and marine research. So I moved over to the this team in October 2018 from my ringing licensing position. Um, and that was entirely down to my fieldwork experience, uh, most of which I gained at Bangor, but the um, the cannon netting license that I hold was very useful and all of my experience with seabirds and waders. Um, so I fit very nicely into this team and, and an awful lot of our research funding for our, depart for our work um, is from offshore wind farm companies. So uh, the, the surveys I mentioned earlier, a lot of those are funded through donations and uh, government contract we get every year but our work is much more contract focused sort of similar to consultants but we we don't do the same sort of work as consultants um, and an awful lot of that funding comes from the offshore wind farm industry at the moment we are becoming world leaders in um, collision risk modeling so the analytical side of assessing how offshore wind farms can affect species um, primarily UK species but our models are being used across the world now um, and we've sort of becoming uh, very well known for our lesser blackback gull tracking Steve uh, or it was mentioned uh, I think Henry said that lesser blackback gulls are very much overlooked um, we've got plenty with GPS trackers on now that are, I, I don't know if you know our cuckoo scheme but um, lots of people know that the cuckoos are moving 
uh, northwards now. They're coming coming back to us for the spring. Well, it's the same for our lesser blackbacks. I can check in on where they are every day. Some of them are down in um, Western Sahara at the moment, Mauritania. But I can watch them coming back up. Um, and it's phenomenal the migrations they do every year. But for for such a uh, undervalued gull, I think they're incredible. And our research has been um, tracking them has has really shown how amazing they are and, and is providing an awful lot of data that's helped protect them in their breeding sites um, and, and understand their interactions with offshore wind farms. So why is offshore wind important to, to research and why do we get so much um, so many contracts to do so? Well uh, I'm not sure how much people here know about offshore wind but um, the UK is a world leader in offshore wind. Um, we have currently have about 34 operational offshore wind farms um, around the UK, which um, generate about 10 gigawatts of energy capacity and try to try and put that in perspective. Last, uh, in this quarter last year, that provided 30% of the UK's energy demand. So this is a really significant uh, energy source for us. Um, and the government has recently announced that they want to increase that to 40 gigawatts by 2030. Um, which should be enough to power all homes in the UK. So this is, this is an, a major renewable energy source for our country um, and is a really key part of the uh, our Paris Agreement um, stipulations and the, the plan for it to be net zero by 2050. Um, so looking at this map, um, those 34 operational wind farms I mentioned are the green ones. So these teeny tiny ones, mostly by, <laughs> by the coast, um, getting slightly larger now as we move offshore. And, and these orange and yellow ones are under construction, underway. Um, but then all these purple and blue squares are um, planned areas. So the, most of these purple ones are areas of seabed that have just been sold by the Crown Estate in the last couple of months to uh, lease to offshore wind company, wind farm companies. So um, they still have to go through all of the planning stages to get to build, actually building an offshore wind farm. So, so the whole area available in these won't get built on, but uh, you can be reasonably sure that most of these squares will get an offshore wind farm in them in the next decade or so. Um, so as you can see, there's plenty going on out in the sea that a lot of us don't really have an appreciation for. Um, for North Wales specifically, these uh, recent um, leasing areas will, will increase the wind farms in your area quite a bit. Um, you've obviously got the little cluster of wind farms here that I'm sure most of you have seen from the Bangor coastline, but the whole of Liverpool Way and the Irish Sea should get a lot more over the next decade or so, um, which depending on where you sit on the argument is excellent and potentially disastrous in equal measure. Um, I am all for wind farms. We definitely need renewable energies. Otherwise, most of the at sea species and land species are in trouble. Um, we, we need renewable energy sources. Um, so, how might these wind farms affect our bird populations? Well, as I've just said, those wind farms are absolutely essential for mitigating climate change, as Nigel's already mentioned. We've just had a lot of rain in Anglesey, um, more than anyone would expect. We've had major floods here for the last few months. Um, all of that is part of climate change. Things are changing. And if we want to uh, regain our more stable climate, which is essential for all of the water birds that come here for the winter um, we need to do something about it but wind farms will and can have effect on bird populations um, the most common ones for avian species are the collision risk so that's the one most people know about uh, a turbine killing a bird as it flies directly into it um, for many species groups this is a known problem so raptors for instance um, are particularly susceptible to this but for lots of the other species we, we don't have enough data to know um, what the collision risk might be but there's these uh, more subtle effects so barrier effects um, if a bird doesn't want to fly through a wind farm it has to fly around it so that the wind farm acts as a barrier um, 
which is great. It means it's not going to collide with the wind turbine. But if it's doing that regularly, it does mean, excuse me, it's having to take a longer route, which takes more energy. So it's, it's um, over the period of a breeding season or a wintering season or something that can put a lot more demand on a bird that is often sort of living on the edge anyway. So that can be negative. Um, displacement, so uh, onshore wind farms, the, the classic example people know about is them being built in curly breeding habitat, for instance. So they're directly displacing a bird that would have been there otherwise. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, removing habitat, essentially directly removing habitat. But then there's also indirect displacement. So putting an offshore wind farm in, for instance, might change the fish species in that area in the benthic community, which can then mean that there just is no longer a food source for the um, birds that would have otherwise used that area. Um, equally, it can have positive indirect effects. So many offshore wind farms are now acting as reefs and they're fishing exclusion zones. So they're providing more fish, um, which is, this is something we're seeing, uh, we're getting indications of with our lesser black bat tracking is that actually lesser black bat gulls use the wind farms all the time. They perch in them and may well be getting fish from, from the bases that weren't in that area previously. Um, so these, these effects can be positive or negative. Um, and every wind farm has a responsibility to assess its potential impacts on uh, all species. Um, we're thinking particularly about avian species here, but um, they have to conduct an environmental impact assessment before they're even allowed to be to get planning permission for, for being built. Um, so uh, that means they are obliged to assess how their development might impact species, particularly in protected sites, so special protection areas, triple SIs, um, areas like that. Um, and then it's up to the planning authorities to decide whether the um, predicted impacts are acceptable or not um, for the benefits that the wind farm might provide. But for an awful lot of our avian species, uh, there are real limitations to these environmental impact assessments. Um, for any of you who are scientists, you'll know that we always need more data. There's always more things you need to know before you can accurately model what's going on. Um, and for offshore wind farms in particular, there's a great lack of data for an awful lot of species, uh, mostly because you know there aren't webs counters out in the middle of the North Sea. Um, it's very difficult to survey those areas. Um, and there are particular limitations, especially sort of during poor weather events. You, you, can't, you can't be looking at counting seabirds flying over the North Sea in a gale force conditions. Um, staying still is hard enough, let alone identifying what's going over your head. Um, nocturnal movement, so when it's dark, you can't see. Uh, radar is helping with some of this, um, gathering more data at night. But again, it's very difficult to identify birds. Um, well at night even with radar and the surveys happen on um, set time plans so they'll do a account for a day once a month throughout the year so pulse migrants but groups that migrate in a very short time period are often missed or underrepresented in the data um, so when you get tens of thousands of birds coming over from the continent on a favorable airstream if there just doesn't happen to be a an observer at the wind farm at that point that, that that number is just completely missed so there are definite limitations in in the data that we have available to conduct these environmental impact assessments um, but some of those are being filled um, now that offshore wind farms are such a, a growing um, industry there's uh, that um, generates a growing research industry also like my most of my position is funded by this industry now um, so a lot of these gaps knowledge gaps are being filled um, seabirds primarily are having a lot of research done on them um, and and good progress is being made to fill those knowledge gaps but as ever there's still an awful lot to learn so this brings me to shell duck, which is what you're actually here for. You weren't here for a lecture on offshore wind farms. Thank you for sitting through that, but it's fairly useful background. Um, so why study shell duck? Well, as Nigel said, they are a very common species. Um, 
I hope that everyone knows what they look like. I'll show you plenty of pictures. So if you don't know now, you'll know by the end of the talk. Um, but they are protected at 32 UK SPA sites. So as I said, these EIAs, these environmental impact assessments are focused around birds that are protected at special protection areas um, and other protected sites. Um, so there's 32 sites around the UK. There's these green, dark green, light green areas around the coastlines of the UK. Um, all of these are for shell duck in the non-breeding season. So uh, SPAs tend to have designations for breeding species and non-breeding species. And because um, there's certain thresholds that need to be met, um, they're all shell duck SPAs are in the non-breeding season because that's when the birds tend to cluster together at single sites in large numbers in the breeding season they're a lot more spread out so it's hard to have specific areas where they're protected um, and the same goes for lots of species so for, for waders for instance and most wildfowl most of the SPAs in this country are for the non-breeding season um, and shell duck are likely to interact with offshore wind farms because they migrate, or the majority of the population migrates across to the Wadden Sea. Um, this area around the corner of the Netherlands, Germany and Denmark, um, is a, you can probably see this little strip of islands along the um, Netherlands and Germany coast. Inside that is the Wadden Sea, which is a absolutely phenomenal area for uh, mud flats and things. This is ram packed with waders and water birds all the way through the year. Um, so it's an amazing area. And all of our, or the, the majority of our shell duck, or British breeding shell duck, head over to there to molt their feathers every year. So um, it's not the classical migration that you think of most birds doing, where it's a spring and an autumn migration, leaving breeding grounds for wintering grounds and then coming back again. Um, instead, shell duck head over to molt their feathers in uh, June to August, um, late summer, and then come back again for the winter, um, for the rest of the winter. So they're, uh, they're sort of migrating where most other stuff is still finishing off breeding or hanging about. Um, and they, they make use of the Wadden Sea when it's not being made use of by everything else that's migrating. Um, time sharing the Wadden Sea essentially so the as I said the, the majority of the Bre British breeding shell duck head over to or well, it's thought that they head over to the German bite here um, there's a smaller known malting site in the Dutch Wadden Sea here um, but there are also five UK sites known um, but we we really don't know which birds from the shell duck population go to those sites. We, we know that most of them head over to the continent, but we have no idea if it's Irish breeders that utilize the Mersey and Bridgewater Bay, Scottish breeders that utilize the Firth of Forth, and then some or everything else uses um, these UK malting sites at the Wash of the Humber or, or carries on over. So we don't, we just don't know really, um, or, or we didn't know before I started researching it. Um, so the, it was identified by the offshore wind industry that shell duck could be at risk of, in, of um, passing offshore wind farms on this migration, but nobody had enough data to really include them in environmental impact assessments or know what was going on. So um, the government department, uh, business, energy and industrial strategy, it's a very catchy name, um, gave us a pot of money to conduct a literature review into the shell duck migration. Um, so we did this in uh, this time, so January 2019, so three years ago now. Um, and that was the first time I had ever paid attention to shell duck. I knew absolutely nothing other than the, their identification before that point. And I suspect for a lot of you, that's pretty similar. You know how to identify them, but you know very little about the population and what the UK, what they do in the UK. Um, so this literature review for me was a voyage of discovery. Um, I learned a lot about what we don't know about shell duck and was very surprised about how little we actually know about their population in our country, given how common and conspicuous they are. Um, but as I've, as I've given you an overview, uh, the literature states reasonably well that they migrate across to the continent and they come back again. 
Um, so we wanted to use through this literature data, uh, through this literature review, we wanted to use BTA, BTO data to see whether we could find out more detail than that, essentially. So we looked at the ringing data, um, for which we have 100 years of ringing data on shell duck now, um, which is, you would imagine, to be a pretty significant data set. As you can see, sample sizes for these graphs are tiny. Um, for 100 years worth of data. So we filtered the data for birds that were ringed in the UK during the breeding season, so known to be British breeders, and then subsequently recovered on the continent. Um, and from 100 years of data, we only have 92 movements that fit that criteria. Um, and as you can see here, most of those movements happen during the molting period. So British breeders are mostly recovered on the continent during those malting months um, in the Wadden Sea. There's some movements um, or, or recoveries in the winter. Most of these are of birds that were ringed during the breeding season of, as juveniles um, and subsequently recovered down here in France. Um, so this is sort of represents juvenile dispersal. Um, and then we've got a few records in, in the breeding months, which um, actually, if you note the dates that this data is filtered for um, quite a lot of these movements were in uh, June and July which actually still um, fit with with a malt migration timing um, so this confirms that British breeders from all over Britain uh, note not much going on in Ireland that's more to do with how few shell duck are ringed in Ireland rather than um, a genuine that genuinely no Irish birds go to the Wadden Sea um, and then if we look at the data in the other direction, so birds that were ringed in the breeding season on the continent, so continental breeders, um, where they've been recovered in the UK, almost all of these recoveries are in the winter. So we also get a significant number of the continental breeders coming to the UK in the winter to avoid the cold in, in the continent. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with this idea for, for waders and wildfowl in general, that they come to the UK in the winter in such great numbers because we have a much more favourable climate during the winter that doesn't freeze estuaries and waterways. Um, so there's always abundant and available food throughout the UK in the winter where it's not available on the continent. So this shows that equally a, a significant proportion of the continental population of shell duck can interact with offshore wind farms as they come across to us in the winter. Um, but if you look at the temporal resolution of these rigging data, so they, they confirm what the literature suggested about shell duck moving across the North Sea. Um, but those recoveries are not useful when you're trying to look at how quickly shell duck cross the sea uh, and therefore how fast they might fly and, and how they interact with offshore wind farms. Um, so if we filter those recoveries for ones that were made just two months after they were ringing. This is all you get. Um, and as you can see, only a handful of these represent movements across, um, across the sea. And all but this one uh, were of dead birds. So the recovery location itself might be slightly um, dubious. It's possible that, for instance, this movement here was actually the bird floating on the tide for a day before it was washed up on the coast. Um, so the only one here we can be certain of, because it was recovered alive, is a female, adult female, that was ringed at Icklesham and 58 days later was recovered in the Dutch Wadden Sea. Um, great, it's confirmed that they cross that area, but in 58 days, it could have taken any number of routes to get there. It could have um, taken the shortest sea crossing and then just traveled up the coastline, which would mean it never interacted with a wind farm at all. Um, or it could have come up here and taken a line across here, which would mean it could interact with, with all of this, um, with all of these wind farms. So uh, essentially, um, we can't tell whether shell duck may or may not interact with offshore wind farms based on the ringing data. Um, and that was mostly the conclusion of our literature review. We, we um, showed that there are an awful lot of knowledge gaps for shell duck. We, we don't know what routes they take across the North Sea. They might take that shortest crossing. You know, it, it, all the birds come down to Kent and pop straight across and never interact with the offshore wind farm at all. Um, 
we don't know what timings, whether they're, as I mentioned earlier, they're a short pulse migrant, so all the birds cross in a week, um, or whether there's just dribs and drabs of them going across from June to August, so that there's, there's never a huge flock going at once, um, or whether they migrate in the day or the night, we, we don't even know that. Um, and their flight heights and speed, there's essentially no data on. Um, and these are two significant data types for those collision risk models I mentioned. You, you can't um, guess, you can't model how a bird might interact with a turbine unless you know what height they're flying at. So if they're at the height of a turbine or what speed they're flying at. Um, so we made several recommendations on the back of our literature review, that the main one of which was tracking, which should be able to answer a lot of these questions. Um, there's a, a decent precedent for tracking shell duck. Um, the first was in 1973 in the German modern sea that was radio tracking so you have to get quite close to the bird to get triangulation um, for it which is is tricky if you know that the bird's going to be migrating. Um, it, it might be there one day and not the next. The, the rest of these use GPS tracking um, which is much better, but often um, relies on you being able to recapture the bird uh, so that you can download data from a tag, um, which in a migration setting, again, is going to be very tricky. Um, and, and although there've been all these studies, none of them have recorded movements across the North Sea or, or the Irish Sea um, across UK waters. So they provided no information relevant to this research specifically. Um, so we conducted a pilot tracking study, uh, again, funded by Bayes. Um, we were already doing some tracking work down here on Havergate Island for the lesser blackbacks, as, as I've mentioned, we've been doing. Um, and the staff there were amazing at helping us at, at quite short notice find uh, a um, reasonable shell duck tracking uh, catching option. Um, Mike Marsh and Dave Fairhurst and Mike Mathewson um, who was there doing daily counts of shell duck made, made this possible. Um, it's incredibly difficult to catch shell duck on migration because uh, in the winter they respond very well to bait and you can get them into a little catching area that you've set up really nicely and they all shuffle in and you can catch quite a lot of them at once but on migration they're a lot less predictable so part of this pilot tracking study was to just find out if it's possible to catch shell duck at that adult shell duck at that time of year because the ringing dota showed that very few people caught shell duck in this migratory period. Um, and Havergate is also an excellent study site because it's one of those SPAs I mentioned, um, which means that any data we got there would be directly re relevant for environmental impact assessments uh, later on. Um, and there's also the Deben Estuary SPA and the, uh, or Deben, I should say, Jeff, sorry. Um, and it's the Stour and Orwell. Um, SBA further down the coast. So this was an, an ideal place to track from. The staff were brilliant, as I mentioned, and we managed to catch four birds, um, which was completely brilliant for the pilot. Um, I know if you're a scientist, you'll appreciate that's a very small sample size, but this was a great start. Um, and thankfully it was two males and two females. Um, and that, that was in July, 2019. So we put these GPS GSM tags, which collect uh, GPS data and then transmit it via the mobile network. So there's no need to recapture them, um, which given that we were expecting them to not be on Havergate for long and to then go to the continent was quite essential. Um, and these tags don't stay on very long. They're glue mounted. So as soon as feathers molt in underneath, they fall off. Um, excuse me. So we, were, we weren't expecting them to stay on for more than about a month. And that's exactly what we got. We got about a month's data on average for all of them. Um, and what did they do? So this is tracking maps. Most people really like tracking maps. This is probably what you actually want to see. Um, we learned new stuff. So we don't, we assumed that birds caught together on Havergate would migrate together. Um, there's very little information on which birds migrate together, even if they do migrate in flocks. The, there's reasonable evidence from the west coast, so where you are, and Mersey, and the um, seven estuaries that birds flock up together pre-migration and then leave as flocks, but there's no such evidence from the east coast. Um, so we were, uh, I suspected that they leave as ones and twos rather than flocks, um, but those four birds, even though we caught them all at the same time, then didn't occupy the same space and time 
thereafter um, until they left the country. Um, one of them came down here, uh, did this sort of aborted migration, which I think was due to a weather system going through at the time, came back to Havergate and then left. The others used the um, old estuary up here before they left. Um, so that in itself, new information about shell duck, they don't necessarily stay together if they're seen together uh, at any point. Um, then they all migrated, which in itself was a huge achievement. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the wash is a known molting site, so it was possible that they would just pop up to here and never cross the North Sea at all. Um, but they, again, they, they all migrated, but separately. So there's two days between each of these leaving dates. Um, so, so none of them left on the same night. There was always two days between them. Um, the first bird took this sort of direct route across. Two birds took a more, um, sorry, uh, this bird went straight across the Dutch coast and then up. These took a more direct route to their final location. And this bird took a much more northerly route, um, which we think was heavily influenced by weather, a weather system moving through at the time. So again, as I mentioned earlier, poor weather can affect what birds do. We've got some anecdotal evidence here that, that that's the case um, and that as a poor weather movement comes through it might push the birds into a very different area to the rest. Um, all of these left uh, essentially at midnight in the dark and made the entire great migration across the North Sea in the dark. Again when I mentioned it's very hard to survey which is probably why we have little data on shell duck because um, they're, they're migrating at times when it's almost impossible to survey them accurately. Um, and all of them crossed within an average of 3.5 hours. So although they're leaving in dribs and drabs all the time, it, it seems based on these four birds, which is a very sweeping generalization, um, they're not taking long to make that movement. So if your survey isn't happening at the right time, you're gonna miss them um, because it's, they're passing so quickly. Um, and it only took them just over four hours to complete their migration and get to their first, the place that they stopped up here. Um, as you can see, uh, these two birds passed through a wind farm that was under construction at the time. Um, there were actually no above sea structures at that point. So although it looks like they've been through a wind farm, a wind farm didn't exist at that point, but this means we have inadvertently collected pre-construction data. So any future tracking work from here, if there's no movements through here, it might suggest that there's a barrier effect. They're flying, having to fly around it because they don't want to go through it. Um, and this bird, although it's really neatly traced a line around the uh, wind farms, the observant members of you will have noticed that these are still at the planning and authorization stages. So this shell duck must have been reading the planning applications. <laughs> um, but you can imagine my excitement when I first plotted these uh, shape files. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, so the uh, data we collected, um, as I mentioned, speed data is incredibly important and was completely non-existent for shell duck before this tracking study. Um, I hope you're familiar with box plots. The thing to focus on is the thick line. These black boxes represent the flight data for the entire deployment period. So, that, so that's the pre-migration migration and post-migration period. And, and on average, they're doing about 30 knots when they're flying. Um, the migration period, although it's a smaller sample size, which can skew things, was slightly faster than that. So it seems they're going faster when they're making that directed migration flight, which could mean they've got less time to react to uh, turbines if they're coming to them could also mean that they fly through the danger zone of turbines quicker and therefore avoid the blades but um, again good starting data to give us something to base those environmental assessments and, and collision risks on um, gps height data um, these tags collect gps height and pressure height pressure data but the pressure data is much harder to work with so i've just shown you the height data here to begin with uh, gps data um, Again, focus on that thick black line. Um, on average, they are flying about 30 meters above uh, sea level. So um, most turbines, will the blades will sweep down to about 30 meters above sea level. And then the uh, average turbines or turbines began at about 85 meters in height. They're now up to about 250 to 300 meters in height. Um, so all the data we collected is at wind turbine height. Um, essentially. So if a shell duck's going to fly through a wind farm at all, it's going to be at the height of the turbines. So again, very useful data that helps us with those collision risk models. Um, 
the interesting thing, if you look at those, the distribution of those height data, these are slightly complicated graphs, bear with me. Um, along the bottom is longitude. So this end of the graph is the UK coastline. This end of the graph is the Dutch coastline. Um, and you can see that the, the, there's these peaks um, as they leave the UK coast and a peak again as it arrives at the Dutch coast, same with this bird. Um, this one we didn't get much data from, but there's an indication that there might be this increase in altitude at the start and increase in altitude at the end. Um, the same for this bird, which could mean it, these areas are where wind farms are currently focused. So it could mean that they're flying just above turbine height at the coastlines, then drop down to sea level through the middle of their uh, migration and then come up again before they reach the Dutch wind farms. Um, again, small sample size, early data, but very interesting. Um, the, those maps I showed earlier, there are lots of offshore wind farms now planned for this middle region. So uh, again, um, we, we, they might interact with turbines in that middle sea region. Um, and then the post-migration, new data again, all of the literature suggests that shell duck make a direct migration to their final malting grounds, um, don't stop en route, but all of our birds made a stopover in this Dutch Wadden Sea area, which is a known malting location. So we thought they might just get there and molt and then go home again. Um, but certainly three of them carried on. So made um, stopovers about two weeks. This bird then carried on to that German bite area. This bird as well. Um, did the same. This bird dropped its tag. Um, as I said, they, they can molt these off. We were expecting that. Um, dropped its tag, but was still able to fly at the time. So that may also have carried on to the German bike um, up here. So again, new information from shell duck that nobody knew. They make stopovers on their migration, uh, which means if you're trying to protect uh, stopover habitats, feeding habitats and things, this is useful data that the Wadden Sea Secretariat will be able to use for um, protecting those Wadden Sea areas from development. Um, and then there was this bird, which nobody has an explanation for. It made a, sh a stopover here for um, six days. Then it flew all the way to the Wadden Sea where we, like those other birds I just showed you, were expecting it to stop. It spent 13 hours there. What was it, 15 hours there? And then it head ba headed back again. Um, so that, to put that into perspective, that's a 500 kilometer journey in a day, which is twice the distance it flew over the North Sea, which is about 250 kilometers. So 500 kilometers is easily possible for a shell duck in a day, um, which again means that those barrier effects that I mentioned, increasing energetic expenditure might be completely capable, uh, possible for a shell duck. It's, it can make 500 kilometers with no worries in a day. So um, 250 kilometers having to go a little bit around a wind farm might not be a problem for them at all. Um, then stayed here for 9.5 days, then went back to the German bite, stayed there for four days and then came back again. Um, so yeah, it added a thousand kilometers to its migration before it molted uh, and no one I've spoke to can think why. Um, it was just having a jolly. It's probably got some friends over here, some friends over there. Uh, go on holiday for the summer, why not? Um, and again, most of those movements were at night. So surveys would be missing these sorts of movements. Um, and the Wadden Sea does an annual count of the migrating shell duck. Um, and these sorts of movements could mean that some of them are being double counted. Um, so our estimates might be out for the international populations that we have. Um, so from four, four birds, we have uh, got a lot more questions than answers, um, but it's all brilliant stuff. Um, and then the and back again part, um, I, I don't know if you noticed, we put colorings on all of these. The, there's quite a lot of colouring projects for shell duck across the country, and all of them report a very low reciting rate. Um, shell duck are very rarely seen away from their study area where, where the colourings are put on initially. So given we were catching these birds on migration, I didn't know whether they came from Havergate as a breeding, breeding bird. Um, we didn't know where they would be going. I, I didn't actually expect to see any of them again. But thanks to the amazing reciting efforts of Dave Fairhurst on, uh, on Havergate and Mike Marsh down there, um, we've actually seen 
three of these birds. So one female was back by December, um, stayed all the way through to March. Uh, the Havigate team were unfortunately not allowed on the island during lockdown, so the, the reciting there stopped. Um, so we don't know if she was a breeder or not. But um, when they were back in October, uh, she was back as well. So it, it looks like essentially she spends all of her time at Havigate apart from when she goes to the continent to molt um, and, and likely breeds yeah, near Havigate. Um, the other female was turned back up at Havigate on the 6th of March um, and was there to breed. But uh, despite Dave and Mike being there to recite regularly, wasn't seen for the rest of the time. Um, so it seems like she's just there for the breeding season, but is elsewhere for the rest of the, the annual cycle. And then one of the males turned up at Clay Marshes, which is 100 kilometres north of Havergate, um, and is directly west from the Wadden Sea. So he came down to Havergate, went across the sea, went back up 100 kilometres north, uh, and then, so again, he's added, he, he's not taking the most direct route to, um, to the Wadden Sea, which again means that we don't know whether birds are taking direct routes from their breeding grounds to the Wadden Sea uh, or not. Um, so we, again, we need more information on their routes. And we clearly need to know more about their annual movements around the country because four birds caught in the same place, three of them have done something totally different for their annual cycle. So yeah. It just shows how little we actually know about our shelled up population. Um, so in summary, we conducted the literature review. It um, confirmed that they migrate across the North Sea and that they might interact with offshore wind farms, but there wasn't enough uh, data available currently to um, conduct those impact assessments. Uh, so we did our pilot tracking. Uh, we showed that four birds tracked from the same location had four variable routes. Um, so they are very likely to interact with, so some of them are very likely to interact with offshore wind farms. Uh, we demonstrated the timings. It was at night um, in late July and um, only took three and a half hours. Uh, and we got new data on flight heights and speeds, but it was a very small sample size. So uh, we're gonna need to do more to really get a handle on what our shelled up population's doing. So what next? Uh, all of what I've just presented should be published in Ringing and Migration next month um, so that those data are available to uh, the wider, wider industry, offshore industry, government, um, so that those data are out there and usable for those impact assessments. Um, we plan more tracking this summer, uh, 10 more birds at Havergate and 10 at Martin near on the west coast um, near Lan in Lancashire so that we, we start to get a picture of what's happening from birds across the British distribution. Um, all of this work, as I said, has been, it's been funded by Bayes and um, the pot of money is managed by John Hartley at Hartley Anderson. A and those two together um, have also just agreed to fund me to do a part-time PhD for the next five and a half years. Um, I got the contracts today. So <laughs> that is, that's definitely happening. Um, and uh, that will be with BTO at, at Liverpool University so you can expect to see a lot more of me around the North Wales coast over the next five years and likely there I will take a focus on those Liverpool Bay um, wind farms that, that are planned I can foresee the the research moving from the North Sea area to the Irish Sea quite a bit um, but the idea of that is to build up a holistic idea of of the whole shelled up population um, of Britain and how they migrate across the North Sea and Irish Sea now um, I'll use all the available BTO data to update our population estimates and our trends, which it's generally agreed are fairly ropey because uh, particularly in the breeding season, show like a very difficult to monitor and aren't covered well by our current national surveys. Um, and I'll use all of that together to assess what likely uh, proportion of our population might come into contact with offshore wind farms during their annual cycle. Um, in 2022, we'll also do some more tagging, um, again, to try and increase the spread of data we get. We'll have 10 from Teesside up in the north and hopefully 10 from Northern Ireland or Ireland so that we can get some cross Irish sea data as well. But also you, um, as I say, I'm gonna use BTO data for the whole PhD. So any data you submit on Shell Duck, um, bird track, ringing, coloring recitings, um, 
or any surveys um, will feed into this PhD and will help us build up a picture of what our shell duck are doing. Um, so get surveying however you fancy doing it. <laughs> I have to acknowledge Bayes, as I have done, John, uh, John Hartley has been brilliant for all the funding. My supervisors, Angus and Neil, um, and my BTO colleagues who help with the catching. As I've mentioned, the staff at, at Havergate, uh, particularly Mike Marsh and Dave Furhurst, um, for all their efforts and help with, with catching and monitoring these birds post-tagging. Um, the ringing scheme for providing the data for the initial literature review and anyone who has told me anything about shell duck across the country, it is all helping to build that picture for these this species that's so common, but we seem to know so little about. Um, so, and thank you for listening. Um, if you want to contact me, you can through the BTO website on my staff page um, or drop Steve Cully a line. He can give you my email. I haven't put it on this slide. Um, are there any questions?